number 10, reason number 9, our 8th top 10 reason that Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad allowed his followers to rape their female captives, their war captives. You go out, uh, you win a battle, uh, a lot of the men will be killed, the women will be taken captive, and what do you do with these women? Do you take them to other people from, uh, from their tribe who are living somewhere else? Do you take them safely there? Uh, do, you, do you marry them? Or do you rape them as much as you want and then sell them as sex slaves in the next town if you decide not to keep them? Which, 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 which would be the Islamic position, Sam? Well, <laughs> the Islamic position, I'm laughing and I shouldn't laugh because this is a serious thing. And this still this, goes on today. Yeah, this still goes on saying. today. This Islamic is going on in position, Syria right now. The Islamic position would tell you that um, adultery is condemned in all circumstances except in the situations in which you have taken a woman captive and it so happens that her husband's still alive, mm -hmm. still you are free to have sex with her in spite of her husband's being mm -hmm. still alive. And then when you comment on that, I want to mention a verse mm -hmm. where well, according to one particular translation, it's not just your captives, it's even the slave women that mm -hmm. you own. But, uh, where are you going? Are you going 424? Uh, it's 424, but it's from Hilali Khan. Okay, yeah, read, read, read 424, and I'll read uh, Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. They don't limit to the just context. the captives. Yeah. This is what's interesting. Now, yeah. Again, why is Hilali Khan important? These are two Saudi Arabian Salafi Muslim scholars who are backed up by the Saudi Arabian government, mm -hmm. right? Now, there are some people who say, well, the Saudi Arabian government's corrupt. Be that as it may, they are Salafi scholars. And, and my understanding, the Salafi sect of Islam is actually the purest form of Islam out there today. It's the closest expression of Islam that you'll find today because it, it almost perfectly resembles the Islam practiced by Muhammad and his companions and the two generations after them. And, and ju just so people understand what, uh, the importance of this, if you and I were ever to convert to Islam, God forbid, we would be Salafis, would we yes, not? God yes, forbid, we would we be would Salafis. Be Salafis yeah. yes, God go forbid. Ahead. Now here's how they translate this. Also forbidden, forbidden for you, are women already mar married, except those, and in parentheses they put, captives and slaves, mm -hmm. not just captives, captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. Mm -hmm. Now what in the world does this mean, David? Well, here is one of those interesting situations where when we bring up a passage, Muslims always say context, right? Have to go to the historical context. Amen. We want to go to the historical context on this because that's what tells you exactly what this verse means. If you want to say, oh, it, it's saying that, um, that, your captives and, that, that married women are forbidden to you, except your captives and slaves, what in the world does that mean? Uh, you have to look at the context for that. Well, we've got the context, my Muslim friends. We've got the context over and over and over again in the Muslim sources. Let me give you the context. This is Sunan Abu Dawud, number 2150. The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Altas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. So, they defeated their enemy and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So there had been other battles where Muslims had killed the men and then taken the women captives, and they knew that they were allowed to have sex with their female captives because the Quran guaranteed them that right. But the question now was, now we captured the men and the women. So these aren't just our female captives, these are married female captives. They have Isn't this adultery? So Muhammad's companions were reluctant to have sex with them. Wait, we're not sure what to do here. And they go to Muhammad for advice. Muhammad, what should we do? So some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah, going back to the passage, some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So Allah the Exalted sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hands possess. What verse is that, Sam? That's chapter 4, verse 24, what I just read. That is to say, finishing the passage, that is to say they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. So there would be a, a waiting period to make sure that the woman wasn't pregnant from her husband. After that, you can have sex with them all you want, even though... They're married. Their marriage doesn't matter. So context does matter, my Muslim friends, but context doesn't help you. When you actually go to the context, you find out these verses are every bit as despicable as they sound. And that is a horrible, horrible teaching. You can capture a woman and her husband and then rape the woman in the presence of her husband, and who cares? Exactly. They're filthy, 
unbelievers. Uh, but Allah says it's all okay. Allah puts his stamp of approval on it. And you know, I also find it ironic that this is a Saudi Arabian translation that mm -hmm. says it's not just limited to captives and slaves. In light of all the reports we hear that come out of Saudi Arabia, where you have maids who are being raped by their employers, like you hear about stories, atrocities done to Filipino maids mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia. Now, why in the world would these Filipino maids get raped? Well, because according to the Quran, being a maid means that you're their slave, and your employer wouldn't consider it rape. It, he would consider it his conjugal rights because, after all, you are his slave. Mm -hmm. So is it, a, is it a coincidence that this Saudi Arabian version of the Quran inserts within parentheses not just captives but even slaves that you own in light of all these atrocities we hear uh, that takes place in Saudi Arabia? And so the point Shame there is this isn't just some, uh, some irrelevant teaching from 14 centuries ago. These teachings have practical consequences in the world exactly. today, which is one of the main reasons we deal with them, because someone has to deal with them, otherwise the practices are never going to end. All right, well, our number seven top ten reason that Muhammad is not a prophet is that Muhammad, in the Quran and in his uh, teachings, allowed his followers to beat their wives into submission, right. did he not? Exactly. And this is... the again with the practical consequences um, the government the US government has has done studies of the places where uh, the worst places in the world to be a woman and it's interesting that 11 of the 12 worst places in the world to be a woman in terms of the rights you have uh, are Muslim countries 11 of the worst 12 places in the world to be a woman are Muslim majority countries and is that a coincidence? No, because as we go through these, you see what Islam teaches about women. But the Quran commands Muslims to beat rebellious wives into submission if they don't, um, if they don't get in line after you, you warn them or punish them in other ways. So let me go ahead and read the verse, and then we'll see how this plays out um, in the Hadith. Chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran says, Men are in charge of women because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other. So men are superior to women. And because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. As for those from whom ye fear rebellion. Notice it doesn't say as for those who rebel. It says, as for those from whom ye fear rebellion. All you have to do is say, hey, I'm worried about this wife doing something against me. As for those from whom ye fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Mm. Then, if they obey you, seek not a way against them. Lo, Allah is ever high, exalted, great. So if your wife gets out of line, um, some people say this is all one lump thing. You can, you can just pick whichever punishment you think uh, fits the crime. Uh, others have a little ordering to it. So it's first you warn them, then you banish them to beds apart. And finally, if they don't listen before that, then you scourge them. You beat them until they listen to you. Now, Sam, yeah. westernized Muslims, yeah, a lot of westernized right. Muslims, they don't like this verse. So what do yeah. they do? They try and, and, and Yusuf Ali's translation, uh, he even inserts the word lightly yeah. in parentheses. Improving there, which the is Quran, not, right? Yeah, yeah, he has to improve the Quran because you don't want people thinking they can just go beat their wives senseless here. Uh, so we have to say it's beating them lightly now what's the problem with that exactly. is that we have not only the quran we yeah. have the hadith as well we have remember uh majority of muslims follow not just the quran but the son of muhammad how he implemented the the quran right now here's an example of how muhammad implements the ruling of the quran this is from sal bukhari lest we be accused of quoting a weak hadith sal bukhari is considered the second most authentic book um, second only to the quran in terms of authority and authenticity sal bukhari volume seven <clears throat> Volume 7, number 715. The, the hadith number is number 715. Let me read it. Narrated Ikrama, volume 7, number 715. Narrated Ikrama, Rifa'ah divorced his wife, whereupon Abdurrahman bin Az Zubair, wow, Al Qurayzi, uh, married her. Well, I'll say that five times fast, right? Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to her of her husband and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by the beating. Did you hear that, David? Mm -hmm. A green spot on her skin caused by beating. Does that sound like he got, she got beat lightly? No. <clears throat> it was the habit of ladies to support each other, 
So when Allah's apostle came, Aisha said, I have not seen, pay attention to this, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Of all the women out there, Muslim women had it the worst. And, and the, the, the reason this is important is because Western Muslims will tell women how wonderful is uh, women, uh, what a, what a yeah. wonderful position it women have in women. Islam. Dignifies and this it. is not just any woman. This is Aisha, the mother of the faithful, you got it. saying that Muslim women were treated worse by their Muslim husbands under the leadership of Muhammad than pagan women were being treated. Precisely. Exactly. And you Very can't different say, yeah. from what we hear here. And you can't say this is just any Joe Schmo. She's considered one of the greatest Muslim scholars that ever lived. Mm -hmm. In fact, they say the reason, one of the reasons why Muhammad married her at such a young age is so that she could acquire this wealth of information yeah. that proved beneficial to later generations. Mm -hmm. So you can't just poo-poo this tradition. Mm -hmm. Now look what she says. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. Remember she had worn a green veil? A green, mm -hmm. green veil? Her skin is greener than her clothes. When Abdurrahman heard that his wife had gone to the Prophet, he came with his two sons from another wife. She said, by Allah, I have done no wrong to him, but he is impotent and he's useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. He beats her because she accuses him of being impotent. Now, maybe what the husband did is wrong. Maybe Muhammad rebuked him. So let's see what Muhammad does. Abdul Rahman said, by Allah, O Allah's apostle, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she's disobedient. Remember what that he says? If you fear rebellion on their part, you can then admonish them or ban banish them to, to another bed or beat them. And she wants to go back to, her, to Rifa, her former husband. Allah's apostle said to her, if that is your intention, then know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Rifa unless Abdurrahman has had sexual intercourse with you. Then the Prophet saw the two boys of Abdurrahman, right? And then he says this to her, uh, to him, are these your sons? I'm sorry. On that, Abdurrahman said, yes. The Prophet said, you claim what you claim, that he's impotent, but by Allah, these boys resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. Did you catch what he did? Didn't rebuke him. Didn't uh, silence him. Didn't tell him, how dare you beat her so badly. Did you not know that the beating had to be light? Mm -hmm. He rebukes her for accusing him of being impotent and, and does nothing to correct him for the excessive beating. In other words, Muhammad said, well, you're, you're speaking ill of your husband, and therefore what? You deserve exactly what you get. That's the Quranic punishment. So right. your husband hasn't done anything wrong. So she got what she deserved, according to Islam. Yep. Now, here in the U.S., if you hit a woman, uh, you'll go to jail for that if the police, police find out about it. If you leave, if you beat her until her skin turns green, you're in all kinds of trouble, right? You're in all kinds of trouble. Uh, but all you have to do, I guess, in a, in a Muslim country is say, hey, Allah, Allah says it's okay, and it's, uh, be, it's none of anyone's business. They'll also be in trouble in places like Dearborn. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, if, uh, if, we, <laughs> if the police pay attention. Okay. All right, so that's number seven, beating women into submission.